What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Real Quick with Mike Swick podcast. Today we have my longtime friend, teammate, ex-roommate, former UFC number one contender and champion in multiple organizations, John Fitch. We've spent a lot of time together um, at AKA Growing Together from the beginning. Um, we had our whole careers side by side, fighting the same guys, uh, fighting guys that we were supposed to fight, and he fought, and I fought, and I lost to somebody, and he would fight him and beat him, and <laughs> it was, it's crazy, man. Like we could write a book about just just our experiences in our in our fighting career, but. I haven't talked to him in a while, and he retired officially this past weekend. So I told him I'd bring him on the podcast and do like a reflection of his career and just a retirement uh, special edition podcast. And I'm sure we're going to get into a whole bunch of other stuff. So let's get started. Fitch, welcome to the show, buddy. What's up, Mike? Retired Fitch. Welcome to the world of freedom. Yeah, it feels good. Yeah, the motivation to put in hard training camps for eight weeks is just yeah. not really there anymore. Yeah, it's time to it's time to move along. Yeah, what, what, you're forty. How old are you? What are you? Forty. Forty two and a half. So you're one year older than me. So we're close, man. We're close yeah. to the same. Yeah, real close. So I'm. Uh, yeah, forty two and a half. They, they, I had to do these. Uh, you know, the COVID temperature check things. You had to yeah. fill out a worksheet every morning, get checked. And it's like, how many years and months old are you? And I was like, motherfucker. I was like, <laughs> count the months. Why you, you? Well, yeah, why are you counting the months? Like 46 and a half. I'm like, God damn it. It's like, yeah, <laughs> you don't have to bring it up. It's like you're five again. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I'm four and a half. <laughs> That's funny, man. Holy shit, dude. Damn, we go back so far, man. It's like, it's crazy because it's like we've had such long careers and now I've been retired for a while. You just retired. So you win. Mm-hmm. You outlasted me. Um, you were higher ranked than me. You had bigger fights than me. You outlasted me. You beat me in every regard. So, like, congratulations, sir. Yeah. <laughs> you're a better roommate you than have me. More money. You have more money. You, you're, you're a better roommate than me, too. Oh, yeah, but I'm in COVID right now, bro. You know what the downside is mm-hmm. of, uh, of having a business, and, and especially one when you are so optimistic that you try to build, like, the biggest gym ever? <laughs> <laughs> then you yeah. then you run into a, a pandemic and, and then like COVID. your gym gets well, shut like down say, for a year. Like once you start feeling like you're getting the hang of life, <laughs> like the universe likes to kick you right in the balls. Yes, it is the worst. It's, it's, you're like, man, I'm nailing it. I got this shit figured out. Yep. And the universe goes, hey, bend over. Boom. And it seems take like the harder lane. you work and the more you build up, the more you take the hit. Like it's like uh, if I had a, you know what I mean? Like it's just, it just well, seems like. Well, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of reasons why a lot of people are losers all life is because they never try because if you don't try, you can't fail that hard. Yeah, that's true. You, and you can't achieve. You can't achieve if you don't mm-hmm. try. So you got to at least you give it you up. Don't, you don't climb the mountain. There's no chance of falling off. Yeah. Yeah, it's but, crazy. You know, I've, I've learned to embrace and enjoy the falls. Well, you know what? It's when you realize, like the same with me, man. The same with me with failure. Because when you realize it's part of the the journey, you almost feel mm-hmm. like you're just getting over them. Does that make sense? I don't know if it makes sense to you, yeah. but like, like for me, it's like if I fail at something, like I hope it's small, like not too significant. But when I do fail, like I feel like I got that out of the way <laughs> for some reason. Like you know what I mean? Like because yes. I know it's coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if things aren't going bad for I, a long time, I start getting nervous. <laughs> like I know yeah, yeah. Something's, oh, something's coming. Something's coming. Something's coming. Yeah. But no, I just like uh, the universe is preposterous and I just I just laugh at the stuff now. And it is. It's just it's kind of like you got to look at like when you're playing video games or something, you know, you don't beat the boss the first time. Usually you got (laughs) to you die a bunch of times and you figure out, oh, I just needed to hit him with the, you know, the magical knife or whatever the hell. (laughs) And uh, and and you end up beating it. But you got to look at life that way. A lot of people just give up. Yeah, you can't give up. And that's the tough thing about being a fighter, man, is like, you know, it, it's one of those a lot, jobs. There's a lot of failure, daily failure. It's, yeah, it's one of those jobs. It's like, it's not about just failure like everything else, but you obviously fail, obviously, when you're a fighter as you're, as you're getting more and more successful. But it's just a hard-ass job for your body, for your mind, like the stress. Like, mm-hmm. The soon, soon as you win a fight is like the best moment, and you have like a week to enjoy that moment. And then as yeah. soon as they, they give you a name, it's like immediately you're like back into like the stress of fight camp and it's like boom it's gone like one you had one week to enjoy yourself and then you're like back into another like you got a name you got a date and it's like now it's just like everything you put in your body counts every every time you work out it's like it has to be a certain amount of this 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 and this so it's a tough it's a tough gig man i mean it has its ups and downs obviously it's got an upside to it but 
Yeah, it's definitely not for everyone. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Yeah, I, you know, I think they could definitely do some psychological studies on on people because that's not a that's not an unusual phenomenon that 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 build up of whatever that thing is, and then you're at that peak, and then it's over, and then you have to deal with nothing because it is. It's like you're 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 shot off this ramp leading up to fight week, and then the yeah. fight boom, and then you, and then the fight happens, and then you're f- fall, flying in the air and you're free falling, and yeah. it's like. If you don't know how to mitigate that free fall, like that destroys a lot of people. That's where a lot of those guys and people turn into drugs and alcohol and things. And they they create this awful cycle um, of abuse because of that, because they're dealing with that. You know, hey, why does everybody stop looking at me? Why yeah. does everybody shift their attention somewhere else? And if you're if you're too focused on the attention from other people like that crash is way harder. Yeah. No, I I agree with you 100 percent on that. And then you realize business. Well, at some point you realize business is where it's at as far as like longevity yeah, like and resolving the income. Money, but then that's even harder. Like I, I I put up some free courses on Gumroad like to test it out and test out uh, selling uh, you know instructional courses because that's what I am at heart. I'm a teacher. I've been teaching yeah. since I was in junior high. So I put out some free courses out there. Uh, kids wrestling course, uh, a 90 day net care. Uh, course that I that I, that I that I used to help fix my neck, and then I did a, a resistance band training course, and then like I made like two hundred dollars yesterday. <laughs> how long, how long like, have I was you... play, playing with my kids? Oh, you mean in one and day? Then, these things, in one day, yeah. Oh, these that's, guys, well, I, I put these up as uh, like something I made just to kind of test it out. Yeah, and and see see how the reception was with people and whatever, and uh, yeah, I, I spent the day playing with my kids and taking care of my dog and. I kept getting notifications on my phone, ding, 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 from people downloading. And it's a free, they're free, but people donate money every once in a while. Nice. I made like $200 in a day. Oh, so like, nice. there's just way, there's there's a lot of opportunity out there to make yeah. way more money than getting punched in the face. And uh, yep. I'm starting to embrace that a little bit. Yeah. And you know what, like, you know, like my route was as good or was good until the COVID, but it's like, it seems like, like if I give advice to people, I would lean more towards like I'm always going to do what I'm doing and you're going to do what you're doing. Cause that's who we are. We, our lives are fitness, our lives are, or whatever, or, mm-hmm. or, or, or yep. whatever your expertise is, you know, training and stuff. You're going to train the we'll, things we'll, that, that, we'll you know, things into that. type. Yeah. Of but like the future definitely stuff. seems more closed. I mean, it seems more like people wanting to be in, in their house, more online, more like I can see like in 20, 30 years from now, people are going to be way less outside than inside. That's, that's kind of, how I see depends, things, unfortunately, I think it depends like on on some scale. But at the same time, there are people who are thirsty for other human attention, and like one of the things that me and I was talking about, uh, you know, my uh, my other podcast partner, Chris Tinkle, we have a, tink, a podcast called Fish and Tinkle Smash Everything. He's a, he's <laughs> a comedian, awesome. so he's hurting because there's nobody going to do stand up yeah. shows. So like we're th- we're we're tooling around with ideas about doing uh, pop ups in the park. You know, and uh, it's a free free show with your microphone or your speaker, oh, wow. and then people go to the park and donate because there's there's people who want to just be somewhere. Like he did, yeah, a, he did a little test show in my backyard uh, when I was away at Fight Week. Um, actually, I was in Indiana uh, doing some stuff, but he did a little test show with you know uh, like eight people in our backyard and just to kind of test it out. And yeah. like people want to, you know, uh, they want to find something where they can go out and be somewhere out. Yeah, no, yeah that's, you just that's have to a find idea. a safe way to be able to uh, to do it. If you get pre testing from COVID and things like that, just to make sure people aren't too nervous. But uh, if you can find a way to to get people together, I think there's going to be a lot of money in that. Yeah, and and that's true because like especially as a crowd, even though they're outdoors, at least it's a crowd. Like, um, yeah, I've seen some of the comedy uh, clubs and stuff they're doing like online now, so it's like live feeds mm-hmm. and stuff. It's not the same yeah. when they're up there and they're telling jokes and nobody's clapping and just, laughing. <laughs> it's just like because so like, like some things so you, weird. you 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 know you play off the crowd, you feed off the crowd, especially yeah. with comedy. So like that. Um, you know, I watched, uh, it was like Post Malone and, and was it Travis Barker and those guys, they got together and did a in cover house. of a bunch of uh, Nirvana songs. Yep, I saw that. That was, the, that was like the beginning. That was pretty sick. That was pretty, pretty amazing. Awesome. Yeah, I, I definitely dug that. But like, the, it's going to be creative. People who can find the creative way to bring people together and entertain people, it's gonna be, there's going to be big money in it. Yeah, for sure, man. That's definitely where it is. Because everybody, everybody trapped at home, everybody's going to be looking for something to occupy their time. Let's go down the Fitch rabbit hole for a second. Hold up. Um, so wait a minute. The first time, the first time we met was in Vegas. Yeah, when was I went to my first fight. With Stardust, a, with right? Corner. Was it the Stardust Hotel? Stardust Hotel. Yep. Yeah. The home of uh, 
um, what's that singer's name? Donkey Shane. Oh, it, oh, darling, Donkey <laughs> Wayne Newton, Wayne Newton. Is yeah. It, oh, I didn't even know that was. I was thinking Newton. of a different it was song. The Stardust Hotel. It was Stardust, yeah. Wayne Newton. Yeah. And Wayne and, and for like people spot. listening, it wasn't like Star. It wasn't like a Vegas fight, like Vegas fights today. It was like uh like the first. But you were like in like one of the. You were in the first Vegas fight I've ever seen for like a MMA mm-hmm. fight. Um, but it was like uh like a. It was in Vegas. <laughs> it was in, it, it was in, in the Stardust. But it wasn't quite like you know like the fights now. It was like in like the the meeting room or something, and they just like took out the tables and chairs and put a ring. It's so funny. So so the. So the promoters, the promoter and the promoter's brother, he sent me, he sent me this photo yesterday. What is that it? Oh, yeah. he, oh, that is that's it. Me Holy and shit, Mike, that you blonde Mike hair. Kyle. How crazy. And that's, yeah. <laughs> that's two how, of five, I got my blonde hair. Cra- yeah, you were, you were big then, dude. Uh, well, because I didn't realize how much weight people were cutting. I thought I was going to be a 205 pounder. I thought I'd fill out and, and fight a 205, walking around at 202. Yeah, I had a friend fight yeah. on that card, and then I was there too. And, and man, I remember rolling with you, and you were so strong. And then we talked about training. I know we talked about our gyms and all that, but what what from that point got you to AKA? Like, what? Because then all of a sudden I saw you show up at the gym. Yeah, I, I, what got me there was so, okay, I, I got that fight because Tom Erickson was my assistant coach at Purdue, and Tom had fought in Pride, and he knew some fighters, and he was just. Uh, he put feelers out for me to try to find me a fight, and he found this fight for me. He almost got me into pride. Like, the funny I thing is you never sparred. Let's go ahead and mention that. You never yeah, sparred before fight. you got to AK. Never sparred. Yeah, <laughs> never sparred. And he almost got me into pride for my first fight against, like, Amir Navari, I think. <laughs> so Rod funny. Navari. Oh, yeah, uh, I know who so, that is. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, uh, yeah, I went to uh, that Vegas fight. I didn't have a – I didn't come with a corner. I came all by myself. I, I had the wrong type of mouse teeth and I didn't have a cup at all. That's and right. A mere guy ended up giving, let me uh, <laughs> borrow the cup and he cornered me. And then that whole, the guy from uh, fight club was there too. Um, no, his name's uh, Holt, uh, whatever, but um, he's a famous actor and um, not Norton, right? He, was it Norton Holt? Uh, Mc, no, it's Holt McCall, McCall, McCall some and Mc, Mc something, but he's on TV now. I think he's on a show on TV now and he's, he was on fight club. And so like and fight club was a big movie at the time. And that was one of the reasons I started fighting was, was because there's a line in that movie about how do you know much about yourself? If you've never been in a fight and uh, fight. it was such a weird start as we go sort of things like this guy was in my corner, uh, you know, for the fight. And I was like, wow, that's wild. I, I borrowed Amir's cup and then I had, I had never sparred. <laughs> You know, I had, I had seven fights before I had sparred one round. That's crazy, man. <laughs> but I met Brian Ebersol okay. out in Vegas. And me and, Bri- me and Brian clicked. We were both country boys. And uh, he was at Eastern Illinois University, and I was at Purdue. So that's a two-hour drive. So uh, I linked up with him, and we made a couple drives back and forth to actually, so I could actually train MMA with somebody and not like beat up guys from the bar or uh, <laughs> um, the judo club, yeah. you know. Uh, so that was really cool. And then Brian had been fighting for a couple of years already at that time, and he knew all the Midwest uh, circuit promoters and stuff. And we would, we would, he would find out about fights, and he'd talk to the promoter, and they, they might have somebody in our weight class. So we would, we would drive to Iowa or Minnesota or whatever, and then hopefully <laughs> the they days. would have somebody to match us up with. <laughs> yeah. And we, like we didn't, we 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 jump in a bathroom scale, and they'd be like, okay, I got somebody for you. We, we didn't, wouldn't know the guy's name, we wouldn't see the guy yeah. until you're in the cage or in the in the ring, you know. Um. So Brian, Brian is uh. You know what got me some fights, and then I fought in Minnesota at Brad Kohler's event, Ultimate Wrestling. I, I, I fought once, and I did really well, and I beat the guy in the first round. And the crowd uh, had a good reception for me. And as I was going in the back, it wasn't really back. We're on a foot. We're on a, a baseball diamond, like a softball outdoor <laughs> softball yeah. diamond. And uh, I went out back to the trailers, and there, you know, I'm getting ready to take my gloves off. And Brad Kohler runs over and says, "Hey, you know, keep your gloves on." He's like, "I got another fight for you if you want it." <laughs> Oh my god! And, uh, yeah, like right after I just got finished fighting, no medical <laughs> check, whatever. Um, he's like, "Keep your gloves on. Uh, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you fight this guy." And I was like, ah, "I don't know. I came here to fight one time." And Ever saw looks at me. He's like, "If you don't do it, I'll do it." He hadn't even fought yet. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, "A hundred bucks? I'll take that." Uh, so I went out there and I one punched, slept the guy. Um, so I fought two times, but I broke my thumb. Oh, that sucks. In the process. 
So I made I made like uh, five hundred bucks and I had a broken thumb and like ten thousand dollars in medical bills. <laughs> yeah, it's like seven thousand, a little over seven thousand. Oh but, shit, I was close. Um, I think I have spent enough time, but uh, I had one of the other pre wrestlers because I was still there as a grad assistant. I had them say that we we wrestled on Sunday and bro, oh, yeah. I broke it on Sunday wrestling. So thank you, Purdue Insurance, for taking care of the thumb. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> Nice. And then, but but at that at that fight, Sean Shirk was there. Okay, he was at that minute. He was at that Ultimate Wrestling up in Minnesota, and I talked to him briefly. Um, Ebersol had talked to him before and kind of knew him from that Midwest circuit. And uh, Shirk was represented by Dwayne Zinkin at the time. Mm-hmm. So he had Dwayne on the phone and uh, told Dwayne that I was an animal and I looked like I had a lot of promise. And I and Dwayne had been calling around to universities asking wrestling coaches if they had guys who were interested in fighting because yeah. he was basically one of the first guys who like was smart enough to start recruiting uh college athletes yeah and um pretty genius because that's why one of the reasons why aka blew up is because Dwayne made these calls and he used his resources to get in and and, and uh lure guys to come out to to aka and uh san jose but yeah they they uh we started a dialogue and then and then um after our shirt talked to him, they they sent me a contract to sign up, sign with them to for them to manage me. And uh, next thing I did was go out and, and train at AK for that week, and the rest is history. Yeah, I remember when you came in, I was like, oh shit, I know that guy. <laughs> I was like, the guy from the Stardust, the strong two hundred five er. Oh, I was I was super pumped. I was like, man, I was like. It's cool that uh, there's people here I already know and like, and because um, yeah, I was moving far, far from everything. <laughs> yeah, I sleep. I was sleeping on the floor. I had me and my dog yeah. in a sleeping bag for like at least two months. The early days, man. Holy shit, that's crazy. It's living the dream, man. I was. I loved every second of it too. Who was there when you got there? Like, who who was the guys? Who who, who all of us were there when you got there? I'm trying to think of the timeline. Um, you were there, Thompson, uh, Mike, Kyle. Trevor yeah. would pop in and out. Buenatello was probably there too at the time. Trevor Plangley. Brett Buenatello was not there yet. Oh, he, he came later. Wow. Yeah, he came later. Um, uh, Bobby Southworth was yeah, there. Was. Uh, Rich Crunkleton. <laughs> it just there. makes you laugh when you say his name. How funny yeah. was that guy? Dude, that guy <laughs> needs a fucking camera on him 24 7. Yeah, he's he the most entertaining man I've ever been around. <laughs> Insane. Uh, yeah, but I think that was we had like a core group of guys. Yeah. We didn't have a ton of guys. Yeah, we you were know, we were like small. Mike Kyle, Josh Thompson, you, Trevor Prangley. Even but Trevor would live in Idaho, so he came in back and, and out forth every once in a while. Yeah. Uh, um, Shirk Cleet. was coming back and forth too. Was he coming back at that time when, when you met when you met him, or was he staying out because he was training AK for a while too, back and forth? Shirk was already gone before I had gotten there, so he, he had already came and up. left by that time. Yeah. I think because so. he was having big fights in the UFC when he was with us. I remember we were looking up to him like, "Oh shit!" You know, he's, he had some. He was fighting. Uh, I think it was Hughes or something. Yeah, but I, and then yeah, and then there were some uh, you know some guys that never really did anything that were around yeah, quite a lot. I remember there was a guy John. I don't even remember his last name, but uh, <sighs> yeah, but yeah, it was it was kind of more like a smaller group. It was like five to ten guys on the regular for a little while. Yeah, until. Until until like the the ultimate fighter happened, and then you know more people started showing up, and we started growing. Yeah, and then you man, that su- yeah, and then the ultimate fighter happened, and some of us left, and you just kept killing it, man. You were just like crushing every fight. Like, how many fights did you have just while we were gone, man? You were supposed well, obviously I, you were supposed you know, to be I, on I there. Was on a, I, did, I had a sixteen fight winning streak. Yeah, it was crazy. From the dude. time that okay, so the first fight I had with AKA was technically. I came out for that first week. It was during uh, Thanksgiving break, mm-hmm. and me and Ebersol came out for a week just to test it out because we wanted to see if you know this was the right place for us. And you know, I fell in love immediately because there was like there was like three or four coaches in each discipline. Yeah, you know, and I was like, oh my god! And then <laughs> and then you could search around the neighborhoods and or the area, and there was other gyms, and I was like, oh my god, this is this is this is the mecca. This is where I got to be. And we because actually sparred. Was nothing. There was nothing to train with. There was no black belts. There was nobody to. I, I was I was taking Muay Thai lessons from a girl who went to a seminar once. <laughs> That's already because funny. She, because she was the expert. She was the expert in the area. Yeah. No one else had, had learned how to how to throw a leg kick or whatever. Like I I I was learning from her. We brought her into the wrestling room. We're like okay, teach us. 
she's like, well, Jeez. I only had one class. It was like a kickboxing <laughs> class, but like we, we were doing what we had to do. And then, uh, I, I took a fight, um, that Ebersol was going to have, but Ebersol got hurt. Uh, and so I, I just filled in for him. It was two Oh five and it was the Wilson Govea. And that was the deciding factor when I got knocked out by Wilson Govea was, dude, you, you got to stop fucking around. Like these guys, there are guys out here who it's their job. It's their full time job is just to train. That's all they do. Yeah. Because he was at ATT. And at the time, uh, a lot of those ATT guys got they got paid to train. Mm-hmm. So I was like, that's that's the difference between somebody who only is training and, and me who's like, you know, trying to trying to learn Muay Thai from a girl. <laughs> Who had one seminar? <laughs> who went to it? Who had one seminar? You know, <laughs> yeah. that was a girl. But there's plenty of girls who could probably teach me a lot of things. But uh, yeah, but not one yeah, from one seminar. One, not one seminar. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was like this. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, yeah, we just kind of like because people wonder like how it started, and that's kind of how it started, man. Like it's, it was just a bunch of us, like, and that's it. Like just a bunch of guys looking for fights. None of us had big names at the time. Once we broke the team off and started over and and, and officially, I guess you would call it, uh, started AKA or call it AKA, Team AKA, whatever. And uh, yeah, man, it was Bob Cook, Javier, and uh, and then the well, team it was that you like, said. Uh, I was there when Frank split. So you were there for the split? Yeah, when Ray, when Frank split. So you I got there right he then. He had the talk with us. He was trying to like lure us away. So for those listening, it was it was actually when I when I joined AK or or when I joined American Kickboxing Academy, it was Team Shamrock. So it was Frank Shamrock. That's why the, me, Thompson, and a lot of the guys originally went. Um, Frank was the head of the team, and he he was five time UFC champion, big superstar, obviously. He was a big reason why like, I went out there too because I yeah. watched Tito versus Frank, and yeah. I was like, mm, he was, I, he was the beast. If I can if I can be around this guy, I need to. He was the man. I remember, dude. I remember being like, he I remember never when I went. Up. To, yeah, but I remember when I went to San Jose, like for some reason, like, you know, you have all these weird thoughts when you're coming up. I'm sure fighters think this way too, but it's like, I remember he was such a champion and such like a, almost like a living legend at the time. He was five time. Like I was just excited to like train with him because I felt like if he sweat on me, it was like champion sweat and like it would make me better. Like I had those like weird thoughts like that in my head. Like the more, the more you train with somebody that's so good, it'll just like rub off on you. I mean, I mean, you've been in sports long enough. You do realize there's there's guys who have auras and things around them and, and they, they, yeah, they like raise everybody's level up. They yeah. do. Like I watched the whole, uh, Jordan, that Jordan thing, uh, the last dance. Oh yeah. You the last that dance. On, uh, no. Like he's like one of those guys. There's certain guys who have that, they have that personality, they have that energy around them that everybody else either fades off and peels off and goes away from them or that everybody goes up. And, um, yeah, I definitely thought he was going to be one of those guys. Yeah. That's what I thought too. And it, it, either way, it didn't work out and that he moved on and we split. So that's kind of where we ended up. I guess you were there for that. Um, and then mm-hmm. we, we decided we all stayed and, uh, formed AK and he went and did his thing and we did our thing. And then we were just kind of a bunch of like, we didn't really have anyone famous or anything on the team. We we're just like a bunch of guys that like had no name and we're just trying to find fights. I think Thompson was like getting the biggest fights at that time. He was fighting in like Shudo and then he fought like Hawaii. So he was like kind of like the, well, he, he did get a fight in, in the UFC and then they killed the weight class. And then, um, but yeah, Tom Thompson probably was the biggest name for a little while. He got a contract early and then Frank kept hurting him and then he, <laughs> and then he couldn't get his first UFC yeah, fight. Right. So I don't know how yeah. long it took until he actually got his first UFC fight. But, yeah, you're right. He, he was the first one to get in UFC of our group um, until, like, Ultimate Fighter and stuff happened. And then, and then uh, Big Mike, Mike Kyle, too. Yeah. Yeah. That was, like, the first UFC event I went to was when uh, Thompson fought and Kyle both fought. And, you know, the funny thing is about that, uh, That's a, this is the best story. I've told it a couple times during the podcast, but since we're reminiscing and people who are listening to this are obviously people who are probably uh, wanting to know the story and history of kind of, like, fighters coming up. Um, my entrance into the UFC is the most craziest one ever because I fought at WEC. I mean, it was a title fight, so I guess that's pretty cool. But Mike mm-hmm. Kyle fought the same night, and Dana was at the fight. So he was recruiting uh, Mike Kyle or looking at Mike Kyle. And I, and I heard, you know, maybe maybe or maybe not, me as well because I was like 5-0 and oh or whatever. And I lost that fight. That was when I fought Chris Levin. I almost had that fight. I almost took that fight. So I ended up losing that fight. Somehow I managed to go from losing losing that fight in front of the UFC president to getting on the Ultimate Fighter. I was on the Ultimate Fighter, and then I lost that fight uh, to Seth, Stephen Bonner. So now here I am. I lost a fight to get on the Ultimate Fighter. Then I lost on the Ultimate Fighter, and then I got in the UFC and went five straight. So it's like you, you never know, you know. And then you, you, know, you didn't make the Ultimate Fighter, mm-hmm. but you kept fighting and winning fights. You got into the UFC, won all your fights, 
And then next thing you know, you're the number one contender for like years. Like you were, you were like, it was like GSP and you. <laughs> it was like mm-hmm. for like, there was no Long room for time. anybody else. It was like y'all two. So it's like, you, you never yeah. know what's going to happen. You at, know? at one point I was 13 and one in the UFC. Yeah. And my only loss was the GSP. So crazy, man. But yeah. But, but the U but the UFC couldn't figure out a way to sell me. Uh, <laughs> I pissed. I pissed. I I was on Dana's bad side after my my Shoney Carter fight when I fought Shoney Carter. It was my first like real big fight. He he came to that fight to watch Shoney win. He he came to watch Shoney knock me out, and then he was going to resign Shoney and bring him back to the UFC. But then I completely ragged all Shoney, yeah, and Dana that. was pissed. So he, that wasn't at the UFC, mad. though. That wasn't at the UFC because he, he went to recruit him because I remember— No, no, no that was a shooto. He, was, he yeah. was there, though. He, was, he went to that shooto event to watch. And I, I talked to somebody who was there with him and sitting in the area with him. And, like, yeah, he was, he was not a fan of me. He was upset. <laughs> I remember that was the one where you came back in between the rounds, and you said, do you think he's really fighting, or do you think he's just messing with me? <laughs> like, you didn't yeah, believe he was I, actually fighting. I couldn't believe that I was <laughs> doing so what I was funny. doing. I thought, this is not, this is not real. Like, I was like, Cause you are you just sure? Are you I'm sh- all over the place oh yeah he, he threw up hot dogs in the ring <laughs> he tapped it he tapped rolled over and threw up but it shows you the grind bro like because you went in there and you you know you, obviously i don't know what the situation was with that fight with dan and everything but you had dark fights and you had to fight four or five maybe six i don't know how many fights completely dark so back then dark fights man that like nobody saw them they were prelims they weren't we didn't have mm-hmm. facebook we didn't have like the internet uh, fights so just nobody saw them unless they put them on the dvd yeah. or on the whatever else and you just kept grinding, kept winning fights, and you started winning. Yeah. The last couple of dark fights were tough fights. They, you know, the, the fighters went on to be tough well, fighters. They, well, they, there was some, there was some late ones that they, you know, they were punishment type ones. Um, you know, we had the video game altercation where I didn't want to sign away my image and likeness away yeah. for no money. Like they, they fired me and then it brought me back and then they put me on an undercard against like uh, Gono, <laughs> Akihiro Gono, who's like super tough. He'd been yeah, fighting since like too. 97. And uh, um, yeah, man, he's got a, a bunch of like uh, cool, like knockout spinning, spinning shit knockouts. And he's just a tough dude. He's, he's been around a for a long time. Yeah. It's like, like they, they buried that one on purpose as they were slapping me on the wrist for, for talking back. But you grinded, man, and you grinded yourself up and like, Dude, like I said, you you were it was GSP and you for like I mean I don't know how it was years, bro. It wasn't even like for like a, a year. It was like it was like at least two years that it was like GSP and you. And you fought him. Um, I mean the fight was crazy. Uh, two I fights. You I fought was him twice. Ranked number one contender for like five years. You I fought think. GSP twice, right? I fought GSP once. They wouldn't let me fight him again. I thought you fought him they twice. They didn't want me as a champ. <laughs> I thought you fought him twice for some reason, but the one fight was epic enough. Jeez, should should have. Uh, after, after the Tiago, after the second time I fought Tiago Alves, I was supposed to get a title shot, but, yeah. um, they, they flipped the script and they wanted to try to make me fight, uh, Koscheck. And then when I was like, nah, we'll, we'll fight for the title. Like then they gave Koscheck the title shot instead. Cause they were hoping that Koscheck would win it and they'd make us fight. So Koscheck fought him twice then. Koscheck fought him twice. Okay. Yeah. Well, at least against, I knew somebody fought him, fought him, fought him, fought him twice. Him I, I knew, I knew I didn't twice. fight him and my teammates were already fighting him twice. And I, that's how pissed off. I was like, God damn it. <laughs> I can't even get a fight with him once. And my teammates are like switching off. You you were right there fighting him to the end, like, and and it's a crazy war of a fight. Kasha got two opportunities, and and I just couldn't even get to him. I couldn't even get past the number one contender. I was I, twice, twice I couldn't get past my number one contender fight. But man, either way, I mean, Jesus, in the list of people that you fought, you've had forty fights, right? Something like that, pro. 40, uh, 43, 43 professional fights, Shit, two amateur. So I've had 45 total fights. Jeez. I did a tour. So I fought, I, uh, what I think a lot of people are blown away by is I fought uh, three times where I fought more than one fight in a night. Yeah. That was like my amateur did, days. <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, one Dual was uh, Monty Cox's, uh, he had his little amateur shows and I did, I did, uh, I fought two nights on that. It was a tournament and won that. And then, I fought in um, Brad Kohler's Ultimate Wrestler. That was twice in one night. That was just two random fights. And then I fought the three man tournament down in, or eight man tournament down in Mexico. I remember that one. I fought, and you I were fought sick. three times. I had mono. You were completely sick and you won an eight man yeah. tournament. <laughs> you won a tournament, like dude. And it was, a, oh, like it was I, crazy. I, 
Yeah, dude. I like I felt fine when I was going, but like after a round and in between things, like I was just everything would crash and, and yeah. feel terrible. And I, I got mono because the girl I was dating was like making out with her girlfriends down at college and all of her girlfriends got mono together. <laughs> she gave me mono. <laughs> and then you had to go fight sluts. an eight man tournament. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. Lucky you, dude. It was all it was all good until that point. I'm sure the the getting the mono was fine, but then the going and having oh, the yeah, eight man tournament fun. was so fun. When I you're still sick. won. I got the belt still. So yeah, you did. The you mono went it. away, but I kept yeah. the belt. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, man. And then me and you. A lot of people might not know this, but me and you were roommates. So in the middle of all this UFC fighting and career and all this stuff, me and you were roommates, and we were living at the same uh, place. Me, you, and your dog. What uh, what was his name again? Um, Bricks. Bricks. Brick How did I forget that? I knew it was like something with a B, and it was like he's so big. But it, mm. that wasn't his name, obviously. But Bricks, yeah. He would just like – my door would be completely shut, probably like locked, latched with boards and everything. And like he would just come up and like bump it with his nose. Boom. And the yeah. door would come open. And I would just be on bed would, looking over at him, and he'd just be looking at me just like this. I would have to go around like, the house dude, and wipe what do you want? The, the bottom part of the doors because he would get his like eye boogers and stuff <laughs> from butting the doors open to look inside. Oh. So like there'd be like the little bottom part of the door would be dirty and I have to wash it all the time. Dude, I remember we were so we were so broke that we would eat frozen grapes and ramen mm -hmm. noodles and tuna fish every day. Yep, that was pretty much the staple: eggs, uh, eggs, tuna fish. Ramen noodles. You taught me how to make the most flavor from being broke. Maury Povich, you were not the fire, fire you were not the father, was the uh, the entertainment after it was training. Maury Povich. That was the best. <laughs> Maury Povich. Remember, remember we sent an email because we were so mad because he always comforted, or I did, because he, he always comforted yeah. the, the, yeah. the female. It's like, it's her fault. Yep. No, there's no, yeah, there's no, uh, there's no <laughs> female accountability. I mean, there's 20 guys on stage and none of them are the father. It, mm, but, you don't make fun of the guys. they're all trash. The men are all the men are all trash. Yeah, come on. It's not her fault. I She's mean, no innocent. offense, ladies, but I mean, if you are if you go to Maury Povich and you have twenty guys that may be the father of your child and none of them are, well, I'm not going to feel sorry for you. Well, if you want responsibility of your life, you're going to have to have accountability over it too, and not yeah. that's not taught. And it's only gotten worse, I think, in in this generation. I think there's a lot of people who expect to have responsibility over things, and then they don't want any accountability. So if things go wrong or if they screw up, it's not my fault. Yeah, you got to own your shit, people. Own your shit. That was us like every day, just coming home between training, ramen noodles, frozen grapes, and Maury Povich. And then we go living back to training the again. Living the dream. Living the dream, dude. And then we would, we would, uh, uh, you got me a job with my buddy Kenny at uh, Boswell's. Yeah. And uh, we would, as a door guy. And um, that, that was what my nights out were, was I'd go and I'd work. And I'd watch <laughs> all the ridiculous <laughs> drunks. <laughs> yeah. Christian would always get me in fights. I was a door guy at, at uh, Mission L House, the vault. Mm -hmm. And I was the smallest door guy. I was like the only small door guy. And so like anytime there was a problem, they always made me go. I always wanted to Because mess with they you. knew that people would want to fight me. Because <laughs> I'd be like, yo, you got to leave. And there's like four guys. Mm -hmm. And they're like, uh, uh we're not going anywhere, kid. And then like they start trying to punch me. It was crazy. Oh, those were the days, man. Yeah, if I if I if I didn't work when I was working security, like my job was to be a deterrent. I wasn't going to put hands on anybody. <laughs> I wasn't actually going to do anything. Yeah, like you got ten dollars an hour. You're like you're not paying me enough to actually get involved. It's like I'll I'll let these people fight and then I'll I'll drag the bodies out. Afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> I just tried to jujitsu them. <laughs> like I was just trying to like choke them all. Like I would just try to choke him until Christian showed up. Christian was the heavyweight on the team, and he was just so big he could just grab anybody mm. and just throw him out the door. So yep, all out. I had to do was just like kind of tie him up until like he could get there. Oh yeah, that's who was around a lot was Christian. Yeah, Christian Wallace. That was in the, in the early team. Yeah. Yeah, he was there too. And Christian has the uh, the record for the all time greatest walkout song UFC walkout song ever. Which which one was that? He came out to he came out to Culture Club. Do that's you really want to hurt right. me? That's right. Do you really want to hurt me? Yeah. Do you really want to make me cry? Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that was the best song ever. That was the best. We, we could have seriously had a legit reality show back then. If it was like modern day, like, because back then fighting wasn't cool. So we weren't like cool at all. Yeah, we were degenerates at the time. But like if it was like modern day and people saw our lives, we would have a sick show. 
for sure. The beginning mm-hmm. of AK. That would've been, that would've been fun. Well, I mean, even if uh, you know the way things are today. Yeah, if we was have been doing that right now, we could have you know had YouTube or whatever and right. putting up our own our own content and doing our own type of thing. Me and you did that kind of quite a bit though when it started. We would do vlogging and stuff like that. We were we were the most on the team that did that. Yeah, I did like 2009, 2010. You told me about it, and then I got into it, and I started getting really into it, and then. I just it became too much pro, too much difficulty because I was getting yeah. slack from my ex and it's just like it's hard to like put yourself and time into something when somebody's like shitting on it all the time and <laughs> kind of putting it down like why are you doing that again and yeah. you know so I kind of get I got away from it and yeah. then I finally have gotten back to it and it's 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 a lot of fun dude I'm a creative person I like to create things I like to make things yeah you know I just I put up a video of me going back to Indiana and fishing you know, yeah. nothing, it's, nothing great, but it's, it was, it's a fun video. I like making it. So going back to, to, to the careers and, or your fights, what was the most significant, memorable moment of your fighting career? Like an actual fighting moment, like winning a fight or, or walking out for a fight or, or uh, during a fight that, that's the most memorable to you in your whole career? I mean, there, there's a number of them, ones that are up there on the top. Um, I, I think the, uh, the Rocky moment in Brazil when I was fighting Eric Silva, so, you know, I'm fighting a Brazilian in Brazil. Yeah. And he they were calling him the King of Rio at the yeah. time and fighting him in Rio. A lot of hype. You know, they they, they do their chant, you're gonna die at the <laughs> at the way in and then all the way through it. And then at the beginning of the third round of that fight, they started cheering for me. They started cheering my name. So it was like the Rocky Four moment where like all the Russians started cheering for Rocky. Yeah. And I, that that was that's one of the coolest things ever. I turned I I turned an arena into like telling me I'm, the, I'm gonna die and, and screw me to like cheering me on to win and beat their guy. That's that's one of the greatest things I've ever done. <laughs> that's crazy, man. And they do that. The Brazilian fans are kind of honest, man. Because I remember when uh, also when Ronda Rousey went there and she fought Betch. Mm. Same thing. The Brazilian fans went for yeah. Ronda over Betch. They'll root against you, and then you show them your medal, and if you, you know you show them your medal, like they'll 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 support that shit. That's for sure. The cool thing about our intertwined career is like. We fought a lot of the same guys, and then we fought like guys that we were supposed to fight, and guys that like mostly you beat guys that beat me. <laughs> beat me. You had my back more than anything. Well, but Eric like, Silva, I was Kinga supposed Ura, to fight. That and I, guy. We both fought that guy. Who? Kinga Ura. Remember we, Kinga, yeah, we Kinga, beat Kinga Ura. Ura? We beat Josh Berkman. Was, so we had a couple wins over Josh those guys. Berkman. I lost to Okami for my, and that was to fight Anderson Silva, which may have been a good thing, I guess, because it was a close fight, but I lost to him, so I didn't get that beat. Um, and then it would have probably been a violent, vicious fight with Anderson one way or the other, probably on his side, uh, bashing me up. But uh, you ended up beating Okami, and then uh, you fought Eric Silva. I was supposed to fight Eric Silva. That's when I blew my knee out, took three years off. I was pretty bitter about that. I lost to Paulo Tiago. That was one of my other losses, and you fought him he, he knocked mm-hmm. out koscheck i filled in for koscheck in the rematch the unofficial main event of ufc 100 oh that's right you were the last fight of the night against him on ufc 100 after it was lesnar right yeah and people were getting up and leaving and i'm walking out to the cage yeah there's still one more guys yeah i remember that <laughs> yeah that's crazy so he, he ended up he knocked out koscheck then he and then i had to fill in for koscheck short notice because koscheck hurt his knee and then i jumped in to fight him and lost and then you ended up fighting him at ufc 100 after Brock Lesnar. I think it was Lesnar fought. He fought, was that Mir yep. or something? Something like that? I think Lesnar Mir was the main event. That was, it was one supposed of the to be the main fights. event. And then we got, it was a swing bout and we got pushed to the very end. Those were the days. Like people don't realize that too. Like the, they called it the, they, I thought it was something else. There was another name for it. The swing bout or the, I thought there was another name, but it was basically, I had a lot of those fights and I ended up making mm-hmm. them on, on the pay per view. But a lot of times, even though I was on the pay per view, I could have not been, had it not been for the card Mm. going the way it did. And what would happen is we'd have to get ready and they would just like put us in when they, when there was time. So we'd be like ready to go. You get ready and they're like, Oh no, it'll be the next one. Yeah. Then we had to wait like 45 minutes. I think three, three times, three or four times for for that fight. Yeah. When they, they bumped me, like I would have been that swing bound a few times, but I'd never been, they'd never moved me. But that was the first time. Yeah. 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 I was like the co-main event so many times that I wasn't the co-main event. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> or something like that. Like they, they'd have extra time, so they'd push me out there yeah. before the main event or yeah. whatever it was. But uh, yeah, that's crazy, man. All right, guys, time to thank our sponsor. I'll make it brief, AKA Thailand, the world's premier luxury training resort here in Phuket, Thailand. 
Um, you can go to akthailand.com, find out all the information you need, info at akthailand.com if you have any questions. As of the taping of this broadcast uh, or podcast, podcast broadcast, um, you can save 30% off all group training. So that's for a week, for a month, for three months, for six months, for a year, any amount of time. As of right now, you can save 30%. It's all set up on the website, akthailand.com. Um, you can use it anytime you want. It's a it's a reopen special because you guys can't come right now. The airports are closed. So we're um, doing this for all the people that want to pre-book. Uh, it's a pre-book special. Um, if you decide not to come in the future, you can transfer it to your friends. Uh, if you don't, if you want to extend it, you can, like I said, there's no expiration date forever. You can come anytime you want. 30% off, akthailand.com. If you're not familiar with the gym, you haven't seen the podcast before or the commercial, here it is. What's up, everybody? I am here in Thailand. This is the first time I've ever been here. Been dying to come here for years. Mike Swick, he's one of the big reasons he's been trying to pull me down here. What he built down here, AKA Thailand, is incredible. There's people here from all over the world. You can train mixed martial arts here, jujitsu. They have weightlifting, they have cardio, and obviously they have Muay Thai, boxing, everything. telling you guys, I know everybody wants to go to Thailand because Thailand's so cool, but you can't come to Thailand without coming to AKA Thailand. Come on. What is your biggest, because you fought 43 or whatever times you said, um, and, and the list is just unreal. Is there anybody that you regret that you didn't get to fight? Like, is there any matches you didn't have that... There's a ton of fights that didn't happen in the UFC that could happen. That you wanted to have, did. But you really you wanted. Know, like, like, uh, the, like uh, there was a time, like, around the time when I fought uh, Diego Sanchez, like, Carl Parisian. Okay, that was... Right? That was that was a big fight that, that probably should have happened, and I have no idea why it never did. Um, you know, uh, just because of the timing, we were both kind of on the same level at the same time, trying to work our way to the championship type stuff. And I, I, I don't know why that didn't happen. Like that could have happened. But then there was plenty of fights like uh, uh, Carlos Condit, Martin Campman, um, when when Shields came to the UFC. I mean, I don't know why that didn't happen in the UFC. Yeah, true. Uh, you know, there was just there was a lot of big name guys that that I feel like could have could have probably had me fight, but it just never materialized. Yeah, I dodged Caro too, but I fought Berkman after he beat Caro. It's weird how it all intertwines. Like back in those days, um, I was supposed to fight Campman, and then I had to back out, and then Daly fought him. It's so weird how all that happened. But yeah, I mean, it's I mean, it's been such a long time, you know, yeah. too. Like some of the <laughs> memories I haven't even tried to access or. Because that's what's going to be interesting now is because I always said that, you know, I didn't think much about the past and the fighting past because I always had some goal in the fighting future to look forward to. But now it's I'll put it to rest. Now I can start kind of reflecting more. And I like I have uh, I have a I have a couple books out. One of them is Failing Upward Death by Ego. It's the first in a series and it's me sharing my journals. So I kept journals all through this this uh, this journey. Right. So I have a bunch of stuff from our early days. Uh, me coming out to AKA, uh, setting up training stuff, all that stuff, up, us living together. So I have all this stuff in my journals, and and uh, I basically share my journals, and I remove any like incriminating stuff, but <laughs> I share my journals, and then I write <laughs> reflections about my journals, and it's it's kind of emotionally draining to do because yeah. your your twenty something year old self is a is a is a jackass. Yeah. <laughs> And you got to read their thoughts and like what they were doing at the same time. You're like, oh my God, what the fuck was I doing? I'm, I'm trying to think of how much of a jackass I was at that time because you were writing all this shit down. So I'm like pondering in my head right now. What is, uh -oh, what, what has he I got do? about me? <laughs> how much of, of a jackass was I when I was his roommate? I think I'm okay. I think so. I think, I think I'm okay. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, it's not bad. Nobody's bad. It's mostly me because I'm writing about my, my yeah, bullshit. I but, um, I remember you writing all that stuff. But like, yeah, it's, um, so like those books are coming out. Like I still have to get started. Now I have some more time. I'll get started on, on book two. Well, book two, I have two chapters in the book two. So I got a lot more work to do with that. But the first book is out there. Uh, I've started book two. 
hopefully, I don't know if I'll, I don't know if I'll get it done this year, but, uh, it's a possibility. I got a lot of things going on, but, um, I'm going to slowly come out with all that stuff. So I'm going to have an opportunity to reflect, like deeply reflect over that stuff because there'll be little things that I have, I guarantee I've forgotten about and not thought about. And, um, you know, like in that first book, there's a lot of potential fights, you know, different names being thrown up. Levin's name got thrown up at one point. I remember Diaz's were thrown up. Guys who, like, at the time when I'm writing them in the book, like, I didn't know who they were. They turned out to be, like, a big person. Yeah. So, like, there's, there's a lot of cool stuff like that. There's, there's like, development of our, our training in there, too. Like, yeah. what we were doing, how we were doing it. Like, my, my discovery of, like, how my traditional way of lifting weights like was detrimental to training and learning jujitsu and all this other stuff because I was too tired and sore to do my other workouts. If I actually lifted, like I lifted for wrestling or football. Right. Uh, and we had to change that thing. Uh, we went to, we were going to CrossFit before CrossFit was a thing. I remember that. Like yeah. Early, but that didn't early work for 2000s. Us. <laughs> it didn't work you know? for me. And then we, yeah, we realized it was too much. Like too we much. couldn't go to CrossFit in the morning and then do our other workouts. So like we stole, uh, Some what we of liked stuff. about CrossFit and yep. we brought that and we eventually developed our bike workout, the Aerodyne. Yep. You know, so that's, it's really cool to like, see us like prog progress through the stuff and build and create a better system to fight. Cause that's one of the things we did at AKA. It wasn't just like fighting hard and winning, winning things. We developed yeah. like a system of how to take somebody from a beginner to a champion. Yep. Like we figured that out. A lot of people bid on our style. I think, I think we were innovators with a lot of the training, Absolutely. a lot of stuff that we were doing. And I think, um, I think we, this, our team greatly impacted the sport as a whole, uh, through that. I mean, dude, think about other teams. Like, I mean, there's a lot of great teams out there. There's a lot of great coaches and nothing against any of them. So many fantastic coaches out there. But when you look at a team that's built from the ground up, so many champions and stars. I don't think anyone's done it more than AKA, like from the ground up. Like I, I wasn't a champion, but like it was a successful career for me. And like for you guys, championship status and belts and like, dude, I mean, I can't, I can't believe like how many champions AKA built and still to this day. Yeah. I mean, we got Habib, and, we got DC. And dude, it was, it was us who built it. It was, yeah. it was, you know, it wasn't All one that coach in those days. who like knew everything and did everything. It was like, it was a group of guys who gelled our ideas and our work ethics and everything together. Yeah. Like uh, there's a little piece of everybody in that. Like it wasn't, Oh, just Javier or Bob or whoever, like, running things yep. and telling everybody what to do. We were all working together, like trying to figure it out. And like, I think that's one of the coolest things because it was such a, uh, conglomerate, like of effort, of, of minds pushing that and figuring out what worked, what didn't work, how to do it. You see some guy having success with something, other guys would start uh, implementing and copying that. We'd, we'd share techniques, share ideas. We'd take turn running practices, you know, like that was pretty cool. I think a lot of people probably like that even give us credit for having uh, a great curriculum and building champions and stars mm -hmm. still kind of think we're a bunch of meatheads that sort of just kind of figured it out. But like, dude, we were literally, it was like, it was almost like school. Like I remember after class, yeah. we always had not after class here. I go after uh, training, we would always have meetings and we would do just like you said, like we would yep. literally put stuff together. We'd reflect. We'd reflect. Yep, we'd reflect. We'd figure out what yep. worked, what didn't and whatever didn't work, we would throw out the window and we wouldn't do it again. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we really did. Yep work hard to, to build a curriculum that became what it is today. Yeah. And even like when, uh, Dave, Dave, when Camarillo came yep. and started doing uh, grounded jiu jitsu, like he had to like open up a lot of stuff too, because he was jiu jitsu based and his mind was jiu jitsu. And then we had to kind of show him me and Thompson had to show him some like, Hey, look, well, this is not going to work when you have somebody on top of you in the fence. Right. And then, uh, he had some very frustrating, workouts and you could see his mind just like holy fuck like this is not the same yeah it's and different. then thank god my uh, uh dave had a flexible mind too because he could have just said no we're going to continue doing jujitsu jujitsu way and but he didn't he like he opened up and then he started working with us too and 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 man that was that was important that was a really important step also to get somebody with that type of level of uh aggressive jujitsu and then having him be able to more fit into a more fight dynamic, more fight uh, ready um, techniques. And it was cool when people, you know, well not people, when our teammates started winning so much and like the, mm -hmm. all that work was starting to pay off. It seemed like it all happened kind of, 
kind of at the same time, mm-hmm. you know, we started like launching off into to getting these victories and it was just like one after another. And it was like, wow, we were just like, it was cool to yeah, be such a team and doing it together, you know? Yeah. It was really, yeah, it was great, man. Those are some great days. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, the training, the, uh, the events going out to Vegas and stuff. And then the, the parties afterwards, it was, yeah, man, that was a dream, man. That was some great. That was a, that was like, the best time too, because, uh, you were a big deal in Vegas at the time. Now yeah. it's like fighters are a dime a dozen. Yeah. So we were, you know, we'd go, we would get bottle service, yeah. we would get taken care of. Like Fight it was town. fucking, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a good time. What's one of your biggest celebrity moments? Like, uh, being a fight, like obviously when you, you were, you were where you were in the UFC, you were a big deal and you were a celebrity. What's one of your big, Instead of like fight memories, but more celebrity memories where you got to do something you um, never would have been able to do before or hang out with somebody that you would never be able to hang out with. And you were just like, holy shit, this, this is crazy. I have I have uh, a two. One of them is actually on film and it's uh, in my documentary. Uh, such great hypes. So, uh, such great, such great, such great heights. Yep. But it's when I met Anthony Kiedis. Oh, so like, um, yep. Yeah, they were, they were the guy that Bob and those guys they were trying to put together like a reality show type of thing. And some of the investors, one of the investors was like Anthony Kiedis or whatever. So like they didn't even tell us. They came to the gym one day. I remember and we're working out and I'm training for the GSP <laughs> fight, I think. Yeah. And or I was, I was training on GSP. It was for some fight. I can't remember which fight it was. But um, no, I'm sorry. It was a GSP fight because it was, yeah, that's what the documentary is about. But he, he came in the, in the thing. And I, at first I didn't think it was him. Yeah, I thought it was just some guy came in and was watching workouts, and I was like, "Man, that guy, that's funny, man. That guy looks like Anthony Kiedis." And I was kind of joking around, and like, "Oh yeah, that is." <laughs> I was like, so "What?" Crazy. So like, I got a chance to meet uh, Anthony Kiedis, and that was he, I'm a huge Chili Peppers fan. Like, that was a that was a big thing for me in junior high. Is a lot of people went down like hip hop and rap, and like I found Red Hot Chili Peppers and alternate rock. So like, that was like a big defining thing in my life was finding red hot chili peppers stealing my sister's cassette tape for blood sugar yeah. sex magic you know don't downplay it either because like dude he, you were like one of his favorite like i remember when i talked to him uh because he was like following you and watching you because when i talked to him it was like fitch 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 and i was like damn it's, first of all it's like anthony kiedis and the fact that he's like all talking about you so much it was like so cool so i mean don't downplay and it he, dude. he was, was like watching yeah, you he was, like he's from like michigan originally and like so I know he identified with me being a country boy, kind of. Yeah. That, that was really cool. And then the coolest thing ever was after I fought once, he was at some fights. And I don't know how this happened, but like we're sitting down. Um, it was like M- it was MGM, like because like you walk down to the arena and there's restaurants kind of right next to the way down to the arena. Yeah. But like it was after the fights and people were coming out. I think it was like uh, BJ Penn and uh, – uh, GSP fought the second time or something. And so everybody was leaving the arena and we were already sitting down to eat and Anthony Keenis is walking all by himself. <laughs> There's crowds of people everywhere and he's just walking by himself, minding his business, nobody even noticing him. Like he's in plain sight. And like nobody's even like, hey, that's nobody, nobody, not a single person. It was like a bunch of people in the BJ Penn shirts and whatever and they couldn't give two fucks about Anthony Keenis. And then we're like, hey, we called him over to say hi and I talked to him and he went over to to shake my hand and my, uh, my, my best friend from, uh, Purdue, uh, Silverstein, he was my best man at my wedding. And, um, Anthony went to shake my hand and, and Silverstein stuck his hand out and, and stole the handshake. Cause he's like, <laughs> yeah. he's such a huge fan also. He's like, Hey, I'm Jason. It was so fucking funny. hilarious. But like, yeah, it was, that was a, that was a bizarre thing too, to see him just like walking down the, walking down the thing, people around him everywhere. And like not a single person paying attention to him. Cause it was like a fight audience. So like, they, their fighters. mindset wasn't, about yeah. music at all yeah. yeah that was cool i remember he would come to the gym that's crazy i met uh leonardo dicaprio at ultimate fighter season two finale and that was pretty damn cool i, I told cool. the story once before but he was there he's he, he's a he's a low-key fan he goes to a lot of the fights but he's real low-key always has his hat on mm. uh puts, yeah. his, puts his brim down no one knows he's even there uh, he goes in with his guy sits yeah, yeah. down he doesn't want anybody to put cameras on him yeah we, people who go to like actually watch the fights rather than to yep. be seen there's a lot of people who go to scene yeah. oh the girl uh that that was a fun conversation too the girl from uh that 70s show yeah donna I, she played donna uh, she was a fan and she i sat next to her laura and she rippin. was really excited laura preppin yeah laura rippin, rippin. 
something like that. She's in the Orange News Black too, I think. Thing, and that was yeah. that was before I that show about, I started. I didn't know she was talking up. about that. I remember. Yeah, she was. Big but yeah, I got too. to meet her, talk to her for a while. I kicked I kicked Drake out of my seat. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> <laughs> he was sitting there with my with his girlfriend or his chick, whatever. And uh, I didn't know who it was. And I was like, bro, you're in my seat. See, I showed him my tickets. He's like, oh, oh. He's like totally surprised that I was like. Tell him to move. But I was like, "Yeah, this is my seat. You got to go." <laughs> I had no idea who he was. You should write a song on your ukulele about <laughs> kicking Drake out of his seat or yeah. your seat. That would be a big hit, dude. That'd be good. That'd I remember. I remember That's Robin funny. Big came and they sat next to me and my 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 ex wife now, but my, my big big was a cool dude. He was cool, man, and he was like flirting with my my uh, ex wife, but like in a joking way. He was like being funny, and we had no idea who they were, and I and we knew they were famous because people were coming up to him, but they had just came out and they were sitting next to us. And we kept asking mm. people like, who, who are these guys? Like, who are these guys right here? And like, they were like, oh, from MTV, you got to watch the show. And we didn't know at the time. And then obviously after that I saw, but, and, and then I, I knew who they were. And then I followed Deer Deck, obviously and uh, rest in peace to big. But uh, yeah, man, it was, it was super nice guy. I met him yeah. at a, got to meet him at a car show, a random, random, super nice. random car show, in like Florida or somewhere. And he was, he just popped up out of nowhere. And he's like, Hey, introduced himself. Yeah. I was, that was really cool. Um, MC Hammer was awesome. I dude. remember him like, being there. Much respect for MC Hammer because that dude. We were out at a club or somewhere, and he sent over his representative to come and, and say, "Hey, uh, I'm here with uh, you know MC Hammer, and uh, he he would really like to come over and, and say hi, whatever." And like completely complete gentleman, did it completely the right way. Like I've had people like send people over to summon me, like some or wave me over and shit. I'm just yeah. like, fuck you, like you're gonna summon me and shit. Like I'm doing my own thing. I don't need to fucking come over and you know like, hey, come over here, buddy. I'm like no, like. <laughs> <laughs> you come here. If you want to talk to me, you come here. Like yeah. I think Carrot Top did that shit or something. I was yeah. like, fuck you. Like you're gonna summon me over. I'm not your boy. Yeah. Um but yeah, he did it the right way. <laughs> so uh he sent somebody over to say hi and then he asked if he could come over and I was like, Yeah, awesome. And then we I gotta chat it up with him a little bit. He was yeah. cool. Um yeah, great experience. Man, those were the good old much days. Much love much love for MC Hammer. The good old days, man. Now it's like it's getting so big. It's like, I mean, I guess the, it's probably it's the it's changed a lot, but there's a lot of good and a lot. Do you think we're ahead of our time? Like, do you think, like for me, it's like I feel like I went to your level. Like your level was above mine. You were always ranked above me. So like for me, I feel like I was, I was in the perfect time where I could be as big of a star as I could possibly be and and be the level that I was. Like nowadays, with the level that it is, is competitive and and so much talent and so many different athletes from all different backgrounds it would be way harder for i mean for everyone it'd be way harder to be a star because i mean um, we came out of ultimate I, fighter I mean, and i don't know though because i feel like the uh the ability the overall ability has dropped i think i think fighters became more athletic uh um, like the heart level you think more, there, well there's more of a focus on stand-up Right. Yeah. So I think that it's less technically sound than it used to be, quite honestly. I think a lot of the ground and a lot of the grappling type stuff has been abandoned for the show of stand up. To try to be flashy. So, yeah. So I think there's a lot of guys who um, have shorter careers because they focus too much on the stand up. And I think that there's a lot of guys who, who you could take down and, and put in bad positions pretty easily because they're just not used to guys doing it. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I don't know if it's I, I still think guys who I still think we would have, you know, if we would have been coming up at this time, we could have been as successful technically. But at the same time, if if you're not selling tickets the way the promoter wants, the promoter has so much more control now than when we came through. Yeah. So, you know, so that that would play a huge role in it, too, because like you have to have a certain level of social media followers to even get signed with some promoters. Right. Like they'll straight up tell you, no, you you need more of a following on this. You need more people here. Like there's no a, buzz around. It's a you. popularity world now for sure. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of that's kind of what I want to get into now. Is uh, you know, one of my one of my side projects or one of my projects is going to be kind of kind of doing that. I'm going to start a company that that I, we can take a fighter and and uh, develop up. their brand and make them more visible outside of the cage. Smart. Which would increase their 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 revenue potential with with the promoter so uh 
hopefully, I think I have some good ideas. I think I can get that done for some some people. That's a good idea. And and looking and going back to what you just said, I mean, you are right about that, man. I, I never thought of it from that perspective, but like like your grind like the way you grinded and fought is a rare thing, man, these days. Like, like a lot of these guys can't, couldn't have grinded and trained like you did. And then for me, the way I fought, like balls to the wall, like just crazy in your face, super mm -hmm. aggressive. Just pull the trigger and go. I, mean, I think there's a lot of guys that are out there fighting right now that I could bulldoze through, you know, like if I was in my prime. Yeah. I'm not saying all of them yep. or anything, but it is a different, I guess there is a, a plus and a minus side to, to the kind of oversaturation of fighters now. Um, because a lot of them are star chasing and I don't, I don't mm -hmm. think they are training yep. quite the same way as we did back in the old days, which did make us more of kind of like, I don't know, I would say like more tough court, sort of like, well, I mean, we were fighters, we were real fighters. It wasn't so much about, it was for the love so and passion. It wasn't so much about the show, you yeah. know, we, we wanted, we wanted to win the fight. We wanted yeah. to be good something. at fighting. It wasn't yeah. just that we wanted to be famous yeah. fighters. We, we wanted to be good at what we were doing. Like it was a, it was more of a martial arts mindset. I think they say like, obviously to be the most successful, you have to be passionate about what you do. And we had to be passionate because there was no real like upside when we started, you know what I mean? Like there wasn't like all the money and fame when we got into it. So we obviously I, I, were I all really passionate. I always thought though that there was going to driven. be, like I could see the potential. When we first started out, like I could definitely see potential for the money being made. Like I, I knew that people were going to catch on to fighting and it was going to be popular. So what, what is it that like, like obviously you got a lot of plans and, 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 and ideas for what you want to do now, but what is it like the most ideal situation for you in like say 10 years? Like, like as far as where passion meets, you know, sustainability and, and, and something you can actually do for a living, what is it that you ideally would like to be doing? I, I'm going to be, I like having my hands on a number of different pots. So I'm going to continue with podcasting I was gonna and, ask you about and that. Uh, using that stuff. And, and, you know, and you kind of have to, you kind of have to podcast if you have a business and yeah. you're not, you're not on social media, you're not podcasting. Like, are you even trying to sell? Are you even yeah. trying to have a business? Like it's you just, you just need powerful. to, cause that's, that's the way you develop your tribe. It's the way you develop your, your, uh, your brand loyalty. So you, you kind of just need to do it. And it's fun. I like doing it. So I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to be continuing doing videos and stuff on, on YouTube. Uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of seminars and, and, and teaching, uh, consulting. You know, I, I, and, and I may not be teaching a fighter from beginning to championship, but I can be a consultant where right. you bring me in for a fight camp. You bring me in to help figure out how to beat somebody. Like That's how my mind works. I'm analytical. I can break things down. I can figure out this is what you got to do to beat this guy. And right. I can, I can get you to that point. So I want, I'm going to try uh, to do that a little bit. Uh, you know, self-defense seminars, uh, online, uh, courses. I think that's a big, big thing. People want to learn, people want to, uh, educate themselves. So if I can, if I can make affordable courses, put them online, people will download those and then I can go and teach seminars and give you more details in person. Uh, and then I have a company that I want to start that's, that's going to, uh, focus a lot on marketing fighters right. and I want to kind of, I feel like there's a, there's a, there's a void in the market right now, uh, because promoters don't have a need to promote you anymore. Uh, the promoter doesn't want to plant the seed, water the seed, have the tree grow, wait for the fruit to ripen and then pick the fruit and squeeze the juice. It just wants the fruit and yeah. squeeze, squeeze the juice and then throw the fruit away. That's, that's all it wants to do. So it's in a position where it doesn't have to grow the, 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 the seed anymore. So if I can create a company that will fill that void, you know, take the seed, plant it, water it, grow that, that fruit nice and juicy. And then we're like here now, now you guys can go squeeze the juice. If I can, uh, find a way to do that profit off of that, I think there's a need in the market for it. And I want to, I want to be able to do that. If you can set that up the correct way and get the right people doing the right thing, fighters would be mm -hmm. stupid not to pay. Or, or their management or whatever to do that because like yep. i remember like like the only reason i've stayed relevant like i said i wasn't to your level um i feel like for for the fighters that were my level i stayed almost the most relevant of of anyone of of my level because i was mm -hmm. always working so you hard had the, at you like had interviews real quick with mike swick stuff you had all always was doing content. something I never would stop. Nobody I was always was trying it. to get my name yep. out there. I was trying to do, I was answering messages on MySpace. I was doing all interviews and like 100%. every show. And it's like, that was a lot of work. You know, it took a lot of work out. I mean, it if is. there was somebody that yep. could do that for me and, and yeah. you know, I would have hired him in a second. Like that would have been the yep. smartest move I ever made.
Yeah, because you're only – that's the problem with, with you know, especially nowadays because guys fight maybe twice a year sometimes. Yeah. So, like, if you sign two fights a year with a company and say it's, a, you, say it's you know, a good company with promoting, like, that's only like a month of promotion, you know? And the most of that promotion is going to be that last week, fight week. Yeah. And then afterwards, nothing. Yeah. So you got what? You got you got two months a year. <laughs> yeah. Really two weeks a year that you're getting a push from somebody who's yeah. put money and time into pushing you. That's that, that's more. that's you're gonna disappear. You're like you have to figure out a way to do it yourself, so that you're always in people's minds. They're always seeing you do something. Yeah, and you're your own business, so you have to be as good of a. Yep. You have to be as marketable as you are as good of a fighter. You are not an employee. You are not an employee. You got to sell, and that's a, that's a hard pill. I was a hard pill for me. It's like the idea of selling yourself. Yeah. It went against my martial arts mentality. Right. Yeah. Oh no, it's go that goes against the purity of of martial arts. Yeah. Selling yourself, so like you just got to get past that. Yeah. You can still be a martial artist and a salesman. It's okay. <laughs> well, definitely. If you have, I mean, if you have the company for it, it makes it better. It makes it easier because it's actually the company that's doing it. You know, it's the business that's actually yep. running well, yeah, your machine that's why for you. You can provide, you can provide the service for somebody. Then, then they just, they have to do their training, and then you go and you you collect the content, and then you're posting and you get things put up. And if they've got enough money, you can hire the copywriters to like you know do the email list and all that shit. So like, yeah, if you can if you can make it easy for the fighter, that's that's the way to go. And any and anyone that doesn't believe in that and doesn't believe in what you're saying that you can do as far as uh, marketing people and keeping them so relevant throughout their career and then especially after, think about past champions that you haven't heard from. That's exactly why. You know what I mean? Like they, they the the marketing ended and that was it. They didn't they didn't yep. continue doing enough for the to build their brand and make their brand big enough that it could survive after fighting where they didn't have to fight. Mm -hmm. You know. And yep. that was something yep. I had to like work so hard to do and still to this day continuously work so hard to mm -hmm. do. But yeah, I mean, I, I would see it be a great business opportunity. Marketing your business is like 70% of your business. Yeah, for sure. It's big. And that's a hard pill for some people to swallow. Yeah. Like, man, I don't want to do that shit. I'm like, well, you're either gonna have to do it yourself or you're gonna have to pay somebody to do it. But like, nobody's, nobody's gonna know that your business exists unless you're marketing it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And they don't break things down. People don't believe in marketing, which is crazy. Like if people... Like friends of mine, or, it's, like, it's everywhere. Like propaganda, yeah. marketing, it's everywhere. It's in your face. Twenty people still don't believe it. Seven people still don't, and believe, they don't it. Like, believe that it's it's real. They don't want to spend the money that it costs. They think that they're not going to get it back, right? Because they, they they see yeah. uh, they see a tangible sign or a tangible uh, idea, and they think you're paying for that, and that's all. They don't see the potential behind it. It's hard. It's hard to see the potential of marketing for people. And when people yeah. know that know me, come and see what I spend to market AK Thailand and all the stuff that we do to market it so that it stays in people's eyes and so it stays in people's you know my whole life is marketing AK Thailand all the pictures I post on Instagram and, and the trips I take on that, to the islands and the boat yep. pictures and the, mm -hmm. the, all that stuff is marketing for the for the gym yeah. and then all the stuff mm -hmm. we do but if people saw what I spend and, and and people that I know that have they're like you're crazy for doing that or you're crazy for doing this or, you're crazy for doing that but when you look at the numbers no I'm not like it comes no. back but it's yeah, just it's it just back. really hard for people to see the potential of marketing, but it's super powerful. I mean, it really is, and it does mm -hmm. come back tenfold. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I've yeah that's what I've been doing like the last two years is is heavy studying, lots of reading, uh, marketing, a lot of marketing books, stuff like that. Just getting through the psycho the psychology of how people think and work, you know, like getting getting to understand that a little bit, how to how to trigger somebody to. Uh, to imagine themselves in the in the place that you are using your product like that's that's the goal is to get them to you know have that fantasy yeah and then then they'll add then they'll act on it Khabib versus Gaethje is coming up here uh about another month or something what are your thoughts on that since uh obviously your teammate at Habib like myself and you've trained with them a lot more than I have break that fight down for me because I think it's a dangerous fight with Gaethje. I think he's one of the toughest ones for Habib. Yeah, it's a huge, huge fight. I think it's the toughest fight for Khabib out there. But I think he's definitely going to win the fight because um, until you've actually sparred with him yeah. and rolled with him and grappled with him, it's, it's just such a shock. It's yeah. such a shock with how strong and controlling his, he is. Yeah. And I think the first time that those guys fight, I think Khabib's going to overwhelm uh, Gaethje, but I think if if uh, you know Gaethje learns and observes and takes things in, if they have a, a rematch, if they get to a rematch somewhere down the line, if Khabib doesn't retire, like he could be the guy who uh, has the best opportunity to beat him.
but I don't know. Because Khabib's still in his prime. He's still tearing through it. I don't I don't know, man. I think he could the be the first guy and the only well, one of the only guys to ever uh retire undefeated in MMA if he if he keeps doing what he's doing. But I will mm-hmm. have to say, to boost the fight, you know, honestly and non biasedly, I will have to say it is it is a dangerous fight. Um, because obviously I'm going for Habib and I want him to win, um, but it is a, it is a really tough fight with a guy right, like that because he's crazy, man. And he you, man. he throws tough. those freaking hands, bro. And, and anytime and he, somebody does he, that, well, he's he's uh, improved. So like he's cleaned himself up and his strategy has gotten better. And yeah. like you know, when you see a guy who's leveling up as they climb the ladder, some guys are just boom right here and they they win their way to the, to that playing, but they they don't really change their style. They don't really improve. They're just there. Yeah, and uh, I you don't see that with Tony. You're I'm not Tony with with Justin. You see like little steps yeah. up. He's getting better. Yeah, but I agree with you though. Like That's I think scary. I think when That's he scary. when he yeah no I agree he's scary. But I do agree with you. Once he feels that that it, it, it's something you can't prepare for. It can, it can suck just doing you know, somebody grabs a hold yeah. of you with that strength. You're like holy Habib Jesus. Just like everything becomes a little bit harder. Every yeah. little adjustment, every little every little position becomes a little bit harder. And coming from you, especially like it's it's easy for me to say that, and people's like, "You're not a wrestler. You're not, of course he's gonna <laughs> throw you around." But like coming from you, that that's more you know obviously a legitimate mm-hmm. claim when 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 you're saying the same thing I've said about how strong he is and how he can just his balance and the way he can make your body move without yep. you you being able to do a damn thing about it is just insane. Yeah. It's crazy. That's for sure. But man. And I'm looking forward to you enjoying your retirement, man. And I want you to get on to Thailand again and come visit. Um, obviously, you have some time now. So when the borders open up, buddy. Yep, I'll be there, man. There's I'll no excuse there. now. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, anybody else who wants me to do seminars, I love to travel. And uh, it gives me an opportunity to make some more content. And then I love teaching. You know, I got lots to teach, lots to show, share uh, share all the all the crazy stuff I've come up with over the years. You got to set up like a world tour, man, and just come through Thailand and just go all over and just do seminars, man. Mm-hmm. Live a little bit. Good. Get those years do back. Like a, do like an East Asian tour and then hit up uh, Europe. It'd be yeah. cool. Well, it's been awesome having a career with you and alongside you. And shit, we were roommates. We were teammates. We fought together. We fought the same guys. We It was... It's been an awesome time, man. Well, now, now we'll have to do some business together. Yeah, now we gotta, now we gotta sustain ourselves for the rest of our lives after face punching. But, uh, man, right. great career for you, man. I just want to say uh, you've had an awesome career, man. Always been an inspiration to myself. Your hard work ethic, uh, your drive, your fortitude, your training. Um, so, best of luck to you, and and I'm glad to see that you're actually going to move on to that next step, man, because it's, 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 a, it's a whole new adventure, you know, and I think you're going to enjoy yep. it. And you're going to embrace it, and, and it's going to be a whole new ride for you. Yeah, exciting times, man. Can't wait. All right, brother. Thank you so much for doing the podcast. Yep. Thanks for having me, Mike. All right, brother. I'll talk to you soon. All right, John Fitch, my longtime teammate, my longtime friend, my short-time roommate. I guess short time is like a year, so I, I, it's not that short. I guess when you're 41 years old, that's, that's kind of a short time. But, uh, man, so many stories with, with our career. And, and I know this podcast was a little bit longer than, than our usual podcast, but I haven't talked to Fitch in a long time. And he recently retired, obviously, this last weekend. And, you know, I wanted to, to reflect on his career a little bit and tell some old stories. And it was really hard to, like, not keep getting into details because this podcast would go on for, like, five hours. So I was trying to, like, pull back as much as I could and, and keep to the basics. But, um yeah, it's it's crazy, man. Like it's it's crazy when you have such a tight knit team and we grew together and and the team has achieved so much from where we started. You know, we started kind of at the bottom, like we talked about, and then just built everything. I mean, the the curriculum, the the program, the fighters were like family, and still today everybody's really close. You know, and I think that's a rare thing um, today. I think a lot of fighters or rushing to get to the top and they're bouncing from gym to gym and they don't have loyalty and they forget that loyalty is one of the most important things when it comes to being a good fighter because um it's it's a it's not a team sport but it is you need your teammates you need people to be there for you and without loyalty you're not going to have those guys come in on christmas morning you know or christmas afternoon and and spar with you because you got to fight right after you know you got a january first fight or something or you know, coming on their birthday or coming on their holidays or, uh, you know, at weird times. But when you have loyalty, they do that. And, and 
and you have teammates that want to help you and make you better and you know they care about each other and i think it's very important and i think we covered that quite a bit and it should be a lesson to all of you out there that want to be fighters um you know your team you know the camaraderie of your team the loyalty of your team is so important um you got to look at that when you pick your gym um obviously you have to have a hard work ethic you got to work hard you got to push it um you know i don't feel like i had you know natural technique I definitely didn't have natural speed, which is what I was known for my whole career. I 100% didn't have natural speed. That I gained um, through training. Um, Fitch also is another example of somebody who just grinded so hard. He worked so hard to get where he is. I mean, everything you see as far as his technique and his skill set when he fights, he learned. You know, he didn't, he didn't, it, it's not his natural ability of being freakishly fast or freakishly strong, which he actually is really strong. Um, that got him where he is. It's just the fact that he trained really, really hard. And I will say this, Fitch is one of those guys that was there all the time, no matter what day it was. If I needed a Fitch on Christmas, if I needed a Fitch on a holiday, his birthday, my, you know, whatever the case, he was there. He, he was there training. Um, and I was there for him as well. And I think, and then we all were at AK. And so I think that's, uh, that's something that's uh, unique and, and definitely to look for in a team. So, Anyway, I hope you took away some, some positive from this conversation. I know it was kind of long, um, so hopefully you had a long commute and got to listen to the whole thing. Uh, we, we rattled on a little too long. But uh, anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. If you're on YouTube, leave a comment. Let us know what you think. I will say this for those of you listening in real time. Uh, I am getting an exclusive interview with Habib and Javier. Um, I can't say the exact number of the podcast or, or date yet um, because we're still working on it, but it's going to be very soon. So stay tuned. Subscribe to the channel if you're on YouTube. Um, it's the first time they've ever done an interview together, and we're going to have it exclusively here on the Real Quick with Mike Swick podcast. Um, and I'm also going to have Zuba and Islam and the whole team. Uh, all that's coming up within the next week. So with well, the next week and week and a half. So stay tuned, subscribe. If you're on the audio platform, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, follow us there, subscribe there, leave a review if you can. We really appreciate them. We always try to answer the questions. We really appreciate the support. You guys are giving us enormous amounts of support. You're boosting us to your friends. We greatly appreciate it. We'll see you next time.